So to start, in their influential book, Constructing and Reconstructing Childhood, which first appeared in 1990, Alison Jones and Alan Prout discuss three concepts of time in relation to childhood studies. The linear model, is it? Ah, okay, that's fine. The linear model of past leading into future, the model of timelessness in childhood, and the model of childhood as present. The book takes issue with the universalism and adultism of developmental thinking in psychology. But it also made a case against previous sociological studies of, of thinking in childhood about, of thinking about childhood. And the reason that it did that was because it considered that sociological studies had systematically downplayed the perspective of the present by placing the importance of the child in either the past or the future. And that was, for example, in studies of socialization, which was very concerned with what the child would be becoming. It had either done that or it had put children in a timeless zone that cast them in a mythical past or a magical present. And examples of that can be found in studies of children's play culture. So things done, for example, by the Opies when they study children's play culture. In contrast to the past-future model, the present of childhood approach wanted to insert children as active participants and meaning makers in their own lives, as human beings rather than as human be becomings. So in contrast to the model of timelessness, it implied situating children's agency in a specific context framed by the way childhood is socially constructed at different times and different places. Even though James and Prout did acknowledge that the being child, so the being in quotes, also had a past and a future, this was not a dimension that gained much focus either in their own program of work or in the theoretical or empirical work that followed in the wake of what was coined the new sociology of childhood. As Emma Up Richard wrote in, in 2008, and I quote, in the process of focusing on the being child, the temporality of the becoming child has for the most part been lost. The reason for this may be that, the, that's the end of the quote, sorry. The reason for this may be that the new sociology of childhood was caught up in its own deliberate self-construction as an alternative to developmental psychology, psychoanalysis, and socialization theory. As Martin Woodhead, who is a developmental psychologist, phrased it, the emergence of the new social studies of childhood was premised on a proposal to consign developmental psychology to the dustbin of history, <coughs> along with psychoanalysis and common sense. <laughs> Valerie Walkerdine has pointed out the tendency to dualism between psychology and sociology in the new childhood sociology, leaving, and I quote again, no room for a discussion of the psychological, nor for a reworking of psychology which could move beyond this dualism, end of quote. In Harriet's view, this seriously limits the space for a discussion of temporal dimensions in children's lives. What is seen in a perspective of change are, she argues, the historical constructions of childhood, not the children situated within a given construction of childhood. They're just beings. The view that being and becoming should not be constructed as a dichotomy, but rather understood in relation to each other, has gained support among child researchers during the last decade. It's been acknowledged that children themselves are directed in time and have a strong sense of becoming. So Jens Kortrup, for example, takes that view. Others have indicated that being, 
from the being perspective is it in itself is outdated in the context of a late modern society in which consumerism and the demands of flexibility mean that neither adulthood nor childhood can be understood as stable and rational states of being. This has led to a rather limited reconsideration or reintegration of development. The findings of developmental psychology were never really included in the new sociology of childhood. They were merely bracketed off and silenced. Both the question of how children's developing mental and emotional capacities contribute to their agencies in a given context, and how their actions trigger further changes in these capacities, were excluded from analysis of the present. And this is in contrast to many educational anthropologists, like John and Beatrice Whiting, or Barbara Rogoff, or Jean Lave, who made, and a quote again from Rogoff this time, who made a move to integrating thinking with the context of thought, so thinking with context in which it's thought, and thus investigated how children's acquisition of new practical and mental capacities are deeply interwoven with their participation in specific cultural settings. Or as Rogoff puts it again, human development is a process in which people transform through their ongoing participation in cultural activities. Okay. And what Harriet wants to do in the rest of this talk is to revisit the dimension of temporality that she considers has been lost in the wake of the new sociology of childhood. She wants to think about it afresh. Children do interpret and construct their social worlds, and they do negotiate and act. But where did they come from? And where do they go? No matter how it's culturally constructed, childhood is transitional. And Martin Woodhead suggests this, as do Hockey and James. Harriet's contention is that an understanding of children as agents cannot ignore either biological and psychological maturation over time, or how relationally and bi biographically shaped motivations interfere with the ways children take part in social processes with their peers. So instead of starting with a definition of development and growth, Harriet starts with a broader notion of the arrow of time. The arrow of time is a concept developed in the 1920s in astronomy and physics and involves the one-way direction or asymmetry of time leading towards increased entropy and so to uncertainty, randomness and disorder. The, I should say that th those last things I put in, and so uncertainty, randomness and disorder, okay, so you can ignore them. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted so that, that you could get the idea to go on for a bit longer with that same thought. Okay. <laughs> the popular image is that you can't unscramble eggs or expect an evaporated liquid from a cup to return to the cup by itself. It's also impossible to grow from adult to child or for summer to move into spring. No matter how it's socially constructed, children become adults, whereas adults do not become children, other than in a metaphorical sense. And indeed, when we say things like behaving like children, or it's about their inner child, those very phrases in themselves indicate that they're not really children. It's a metaphor, a simile. Much of the entertainment value of films like Big, Billy Madison, and the curious case of Benjamin Button lies in our knowledge of this irreversibility. The arrow of time makes both history and single lives. We may conceive of both processes as ongoing and formative sedimentations of events and experiences brought on by action, or, as Henri Bergson has formulated it, we may speak of the body as an ever-advancing boundary between the future and the past, as a pointed end which our past is continually driving forward into our future. Whereas my body, taken at a single moment, is but a conductor interposed between objects which influence it and those on which it acts, it is, on the other hand, when we place in the flux of time, always situated at the very point where my past expires in a deed. 
This way of thinking does not necessarily imply that these actions are fully determined, nor that the arrow of time is solely progressive. So Harriet wants to detach the concept of linearity, a line, from linear determinism. In addition to this, what moves with the arrow of time for the individual being is not a single principle of biological maturation, but many social processes that interact with each other. So the predictable and the unpredictable will blend together and will need a social world and agency to materialize. In a paper that Harriet and I have so far not finished, but that has been in preparation for um, quite a long time, since Harriet and Hannah um, uh, funded us at the Center for Advanced Studies in Oslo, um, uh, Anne Phoenix and Harriet Bajanum Nielsen have used the image of a multiple double helix. Different threads of development and learning, separated and intertwined, twisting around each other through the process of time. Development is here not defined by a specific endpoint, but as a widening of capacities in different areas. Emotional and relational issues may, for instance, be seen as important driving forces in a social process that calls for the acquisition of new competences, inextricably linking the different aspects of development. This view is also found in the work of the Swedish developmental psychology, uh, child researcher, uh, Gunilla Haldane, who argues for a recapture of the concept of development as something that is accomplished through relations and over time. Haldane also wants to acknowledge the interplay between biological, psychological, and social aspects of the process. The arrow of time becomes particularly visible in longitudinal studies because it's part and parcel of the methodology. So does the interweaving of the predictable and the unpredictable, and the human agency and intervention that's needed to accomplish change. To give a very simple empirical illustration of this, Harriet draws um, in the next bit of the paper on a study in which she observed a Norwegian school class each year from when they entered um, nursery, uh, when, when they entered school at age seven in 1992 until they left compulsory education nine years later. Four short observations following the arrow of time from first to ninth grade may illustrate how the children's joint cultural constructions and their social, emotional, and cognitive maturation over time feed into each other. So Astrid approaches Marta again. What was its name again? And that's the teddy at Marta's desk. Astrid leaves her seat and approaches Marta. Kaja has been carrying around a toy giraffe all day, holding on to one of its legs. Sometimes she smilingly threatens some of the other children with it. Emily's toy animal tells her that it wants to stay in the classroom during recess and is allowed to stay on her desk while Emily goes out. What we see here is an emotional conflict that initiates a social process. The insecurity in the new situation can be seen as handled by stuffed animals as transitional objects in Winnicott's terms. The animals may also help to secure the vulnerable self-esteem of the children in this new situation. The child can take the position at the competent, of the competent party when telling the animal how to behave in the classroom. At the same time, the animals are a perfect means with which to establish contact with other children and to build a peer culture that also strengthens the individual child's position towards the grown-ups and the school system. Gradually, the animals are exchanged for other attractive objects through which the children increase their competence in social interaction with each other and through which they learn to oppose authority. The use of jokes in third grade is a way to approach taboos of school and the adult world, and the children are learning how to act together and use arguments to form a united front. 
In front of the class, the boys are rehearsing the jokes they're supposed to perform at the show tonight for the parents. Jakob tells his joke so fast that nobody understands it. Halva's joke about a green ghost who gets scared by a Norwegian wearing pink underpants receives much laughter among the children. When it's Lars' turn, the boys first discuss among themselves what joke to make and end up with a joke about someone who farts. The teacher, Carrie, reminds them that they'd agreed that there would be no jokes about peeing and pooing. But fart is okay, a girl Tuva says persuasively. It's so popular, Kari. <laughs> Nora chimes in. Kari accepts the fart joke. Well, this joint developmental work to become more independent of the grown-ups increases the children's capacity for decentering and for social collaboration. A few years later, this work is done with new mental tools. The discovery of the, the linguistic forms and their contingent relation to reference, a beginning mastery of a new form of abstract thinking. A group of children talk about the ghost stories they're supposed to hand in tomorrow. Emily thinks it would be fun if the story started somewhat slowly and then ended up like bang, crash, dong. Astrid also has an idea. Couldn't we do like Mrs. M. Erda? Emily and the other children laugh out loud, but then it should be Mrs. M. Erdered, one says, because it isn't she was murder, but she was murdered. So Mrs. M. Erdered must be right. In Norwegian, the acoustic difference is bigger, as there's a shift from O to Y in the two words, from Mrs. M. Order to Mrs. M. I, I think a Norwegian will have to say that. <laughs> Mrs. M. <laughs> Thank you, okay. <laughs> Astrid says that there's also a murderer. So he can be a Mr. Murderer. Mr. Murderer and Mrs. Murdered, or no, she corrects herself. Mrs. M. Murdered and Mr. M. Murderer. Hannah? <laughs> Just Mrs. M. Murdered and Mrs. M. Murdered. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It is also fun that it sounds a bit like another word, which means something quite different, untranslatable from the Norwegian, in which the name of the murderer sounds like the word word. Yeah. Okay. It's just playing with the part of the word, yeah. Okay. The children discuss that it may be a little strange to have a name that indicates that you'll be murdered later in your life. <laughs> Some years later, we see how this mastery of logic and abstract thinking, exercised so eagerly together here, can be put to new use. For instance, in situations where teachers the children don't like trigger an emotional reaction. So this is a Norwegian lesson, work with poems. Nora becomes indignant when the teacher claims that April and will rhyme. She has a long and principled argument against it. How can one know that it was supposed to be a rhyme inside the head of the author when it actually does not rhyme? The four boys and Tuva join the discussion and continue the argument with the teacher. When the teacher finally stops the discussion, Nora brings up a new aspect. Will we get a bad mark because we did not understand this? She continues to argue and concludes by stating a general law. Only words with identical endings in written and spoken language can be called rhymes. What we see here is a rising mastery of cognitive and social forms, which are isolated from neither the culture invented by the children nor their emotional projects. Social, cognitive, and emotional developments are not external to what is going on in the peer group. They provide some of the tools used to div divert energy and make things happen in a way that's deeply integrated in the relations with others. Harriet's concern here is that if the present of childhood is not connected to the arrow of time, we risk losing the temporal dimension, also within studies of the present. If we leave out the past-future dimension, here understood as the arrow of time connected to the maturation, development, biography, and subject formation, we tend to reduce time to space. Growing up becomes a movement through different social orders, 
instead of a movement through time, as Up Richard suggests. We may have processes, but not development, meanings, but not subjects, movements, but not biographical lifelines. Okay, and I'm just going to repeat that because I think that it's germane to her argument. So, um, if the present of childhood is not connected to the arrow of time, we risk losing the temporal dimension also within studies of the present. If we leave out the past future dimension, here understood as the arrow of time, connected to the maturation, development, biography, and subject formation, we tend to reduce time to space. Growing up becomes a movement through different social orders instead of a movement through time, as Up Richard suggests. We may have processes, but not development, meanings, but not subjects, movements, but not biographical lifelines. Instead of staying in those dichotomies, Harriet suggests that the microprocesses in, in daily life are of a different temporal mode than the arrow of time, and that both are needed in order to understand how change is accomplished. Psychoanalytic theory finds a way to keep both temporalities in mind instead of having to choose between them. The complexity of time is grasped in the psychoanalytic aphorism that, and I quote, the analytic treatment has come to an end when the patient understands that it could go on forever. The paradox is linked to the conception of different psychic and temporal processes within the subject. Freud's dynamic model of the unconscious, the pre-conscious and the conscious, or the topographical model of id, ego, and superego, implies a decentered subject that contains multiple temporalities and thus simultaneously exists within and without the arrow of time. Perelberg suggests that the unconscious works through primary processes characterized by displacement, condensation, conditions of representability, and an absence of chronological time. But the ability to think starts when the omnipotent control over the objects is broken, which in other words means that a child has to acknowledge that there are other people with their own separate agendas in the world. This experience creates a space where thinking and time starts. When the ego enters the scene, time and history also make their first appearances, as, as the British psychoanalyst Rosine Perelberg says. Secondary processes, which are the working mode of the conscious parts of the ego, are ruled by principles of realism and chronology. Processes of semiosis and flows of energy require neither a temporal dimension nor an ego, but getting on with your life requires both. According to the Italian psychoanalyst Andrea Sabadini, quote, it is this contrast of temporalities that shapes the analytic encounter, modulating its rhythm and punctuating its discourse. Each of these temporalities is unthinkable without the other. End of quote. The point of the interplay between past and present temporal dimensions in the analytic encounter is not, says Sabadini, to dig up old skeletons of the past, but the hope of bringing about new life, of bringing about some change in the organization of the internal world. Without this dimension, he says, creative timelessness will turn into sterile repetitiveness. Thus, the analytic encounter will have to end for life to continue. Or as Freud once said, much is gained for the patient if the psychoanalytic treatment succeeds in transforming neurotic conflicts into common unhappiness. This understanding is exactly what is rejected as, as repetition and normalization in much post-structuralist work. Deleuze and Guattari in Anti-Oedipus for instance, argue that the aim of psychoanalysis should not be to reintegrate the subject into society, but to liberate libidinal energy within social reality as a revolutionary force. Thus, the secondary process with the development of an ego is only seen as the power of suppression by the state prolonged into the individual mind. In the later work of Deleuze and Guattari, the somewhat paradoxical outcome of this view with regard to freedom and political agency is solved by dismissing the whole idea of the subject. 
also in the work of other post-structuralists, like Judith Butler. The solution seems to be to reject the notion of being as inherently essentialist and tied up in discourses of progress, rationality, and normalization. By replacing the being of the subject with an endless semiotic or effective flow of continuously becoming, time is lost. Paradoxically, since a never-ending process with no start or beginning appears to merge with timelessness. Lois McMay has pointed out this lack of a temporal dimension in Butler's work when she writes that Butler tends to construe gender, and I quote, as a relatively atemporal system of dominant norms, where the possibility for change is linked to the constitutive instability of those norms, unmediated by praxis or agency. Butler conflates linguistic indeterminacy with agency and time. So it seems that there are two partly incompatible lines of thinking here. One that includes subjects, agency, and praxis, and one that rejects all these as rationalist and essentialist notions, but then at the expense of time. Harriet's argument here is that she does not feel convinced of the necessity of choosing between either a fully conscious and rationalist humanist subject or a subject deprived of all rationality and agency, just floating along, either with its own sexual energy or constituted in interwoven matrices of anonymous power. First, the psychoanalytic concept of a decentered psychological subject does not fit into any camp here. It is neither the coherent and rational subject of humanist philosophy, nor a subject stripped of all kinds of agency, thinking and will. Rather, it is a subject that lives and must live in a continuous tension between the contradictory logics of the conscious and the unconscious. Second, Harriet also maintains that the development of secondary processes is a precondition for relating to other people as separate beings. And this is one of the huge accomplishments of development. Children grow through social and emotional relations. And since there is no relation without conflict, a reality principle or secondary process will always be implied in a process of becoming. So for Harriet, it's preferable to pursue the question of how the timelessness of the unconscious and the arrow of time interact. Harriet suggests that the psychoanalytic concept of deferred action, or natra, I never could say that word. Na somebody, can somebody help? Um, natra, I can never say it. I'll spell it, actually. Apologies to Harriet here for having to do this. N-A-C-H-T-R-A-G L-I-C-H-K-E-I-T. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just say it once more loudly. I, I, I don't speak German, actually, but Nachträglichkeit. Thank you. So it's the, it's the psychoanalytic concept of deferred action, as it is called in German. In English, actually, um, may indicate a way to think about this. It de designates a resignification of earlier experiences in the light of later levels of maturity, new experiences, or different contexts. The French expression après coup grasps this better, as this is, and so do I, as this is a signification. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> as this is a signification that is not determined by prior experience, but comes into existence through the very act of reinterpretation. And it may sometimes be repressed in the same move. A resignification happens here in the present, which is a connection between past and future, and is neither predictable nor accidental. The same plot exists in many versions, <coughs> corresponding to the level of maturation and actual life circumstances. The subject emerges here as layers of interpretation from different points in time, as a formative sedimentation in which old interpretations are not just replaced by new ones, but exist as possibilities in a timeless universe. Perelberg, Perelberg writes that, Sorry, these should have gone up before. So let me, let me just go back. There should have been some space for you not to look at anything for a while. Um, and then I'm just going to give you a, a couple of um, seconds to look at the picture. Can you see it? Um, 
and then we move on to Perelberg. It is not, therefore, a question of a linear cumulative effect that resulted in a symptom, but a reorganization of already existing memory traces related to new stages of maturation. This notion rules out linear determinism and emphasizes the relevance of the present when, reinterpret when reinterpreting the past. In Freud's formulation, fantasies constantly reshape memories retrospectively. The concept of après coup is related to a theory of the mind that includes several temporalities. We actually find exactly the same line of thinking in Bergson. Thus, gradually is formed an experience of an entirely different order, which accumulates with the body. It no longer represents our past to us, it acts it. And if it still deserves the name of memory, it is not because it conserves bygone images, but because it prolongs their useful effects into the present moment. Harriet considers that this line of thinking may also lend meaning to the ways in which continuity and change are always simultaneously present in the development of subjectivity, in children as well as in adults. To illustrate this, Harriet will present another part of her longitudinal data, this time not focused on how the group of children move and develop, but on how a single child moves through time and changes, but still in some ways stays the same. What is true for the peer group is also true for the individual person. Emotional energy and relational conflicts seem to drive development. From the very first day of school, Astrid appeared to Harriet as an active, extroverted, and strong-willed child. She often found things unjust, stupid, or too difficult, and did not hesitate to express this out loud. Harriet's observations indicate that in the early years of school, Astrid often corrected and moralized towards the other children, as well as the teacher. But at the same time, she broke the same rules herself. She was very often at the center of trouble, as she was extremely interested in social relations, but not very refined in her handling of them. <laughs> she often reminded Harriet of a bull in a china shop, looking somewhat surprised and hurt when confronted with all the smashed glass around her. Astrid complains loudly about all her pens being dry. Mine too, Kristin says, and the two girls continue discussing the pen situation. The teacher reminds the class of the zipper. Astrid turns to Nina, who hasn't uttered a word during the entire lesson, and says, remember the zipper? Since Harriet only saw Astrid in school, Harriet does not know why she approached the world in this way. But Harriet came to recognize it as a pattern in her being and relating to others. However, Harriet also saw how this pattern took on different shapes and meanings as she came of age. By way of reacting to feedback from others, as well as to her own growing cognitive and social capacities, she seemed to author new plots of her specific relation with the world. In this way, she was growing by adding ever new layers to her subjectivity. For instance, as time went by, Astrid transformed her relational strategy into teasing the boys. We could see this as a first resignification of her specific relation to the world. Ulla is back in school today. Astrid says to him, it was peaceful in the class while you were gone. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I guess it was, Ulla says friendly. Astrid, do, do you know that you are noisy, Ulla? You are too. Astrid grabs his arm and threatens half in jest to beat him up during the break. Ulla and another boy laugh. Astrid grabs hold of Ulla's sweater anew and Ulla protests. The sweater may be damaged. Astrid, I don't give a shit about that. The teacher comes by and reminds Astrid to take off her shoes, a rule in this classroom in winter. Astrid gets up, mumbling, teachers see everything. While she passes Harold, she says, Harold, take off your shoes. <laughs> 
Astrid also learns how to drive the teachers mad, and from the fourth grade onward, she excels at this. She receives more and more rebukes as she goes through primary school and becomes more and more noisy, ironic, and disruptive, especially with other teachers than her main teacher. She does quite well academically, however, and she's included in the girls' group, even if they find her a bit tiring sometimes. Astrid's boisterous behavior reaches its peak in the sixth grade, 12 to 13 years. She's now the tallest in the class, has a rather deep voice, and is highly visible and audible everywhere. She appears to be the rowdiest student in the class, always yelling, protesting, or making funny remarks, and not holding anything back when something or anyone irritates her. While some of the girls have now started wearing fashionable clothes and stripes in their hair, Astrid literally looks like a boy with her short hair, big loose sweatshirt, camouflage trousers, and running shoes. But time is running out for such looks and behavior. Cultural gender is lurking on the horizon in a new way. Even if the boys are still small and immature, they're gaining a new weapon outside of the gender equality regime under which they've lived throughout their childhood, sexualizing the girls. As part of the teasing, Harriet hears, hears them call Astrid puta, whore in Spanish, an attack it is more difficult for her to fend back than when they fight physically. One day, Harriet finds Astrid crying in the girls' room. Astrid sits on the floor and two girls are comforting her. She tells me that Ulla and Alec have teased her for looking like a boy, that she talks like a boy and behaves like a boy. For some time, they've given her the nickname Man and she can't take it anymore. It is not because she wants to be a boy that she wears big, loose sweatshirts. It's because she likes it. Harriet suddenly realizes from the black stripes on her cheeks that she's wearing mascara. Harriet also notices the feminine t-shirt she wears under her rough sweatshirt. After the lesson, the teacher asks her why she'd cried. Astrid tells her, and she smiles a little, little when the teacher says, you don't look a bit like a boy, you look like Astrid. This event also seems to lead to an energetic resignification of how to handle her relation to others and herself. When Harriet arrives a year later, Harriet hardly recognizes her as she slow slowly walks up the stairs wearing very tight black pants and a pink leather jacket. She has a long fringe partly covering her eyes and the hair tinted a bit red and wears smart sunglasses in her hair even though it's still winter. She's wearing heavy makeup, glitter on her cheeks and earrings. Most of the other girls have also changed their looks, while the boys are still small. But Astrid is clearly in the lead with a new girl in the class. These two are constantly audible in the classroom, mostly through funny remarks, lazy protests, playing at being offended, and teasing flirtingly with the young male teachers. She now combines her physical strength and competence with academic achievement, as well as with flirting and body language. Outside the classroom, Harriet sees Astrid holding Harkon in an iron grip. He takes revenge, and she screams and laughs. She sends him a big, beaming smile. I've never seen that before, says Harriet. Harkon continues to attack her while she descends the stairs to the canteen. She smiles and hits back, but in a somewhat lazy and flirtatious way. In the canteen, she continues the lazy play fighting with more boys, all the time with a big smile. She sits down, rocks gently to the music, meets the eyes of Thomas, nudging him gently. He seems very attracted to her and looks at her non-stop. She's developed into a master of the flirt, using her eyes, her smile, her comments, being both active and seductive. Mastering both the boy's culture and the code of sexuality certainly gives her quite some power. Did you say anything about me, she says in a husky voice. Did you say some shit about me? Astrid has adjusted to the expectations of what a girl of 14 or 15 should look like, but she's also managed staying in power by shifting her weapons from fight to flirt, 
In many ways, we can see how her training in fights and conflicts throughout childhood, in addition to her knowledge and competence within traditional boys' areas, gives her a solid basis for this strategy. But she also feels vulnerable and angry beneath her seductive manners. She finds it hard work to stay in control, and that the battle with the boys is uneven from the start. Also, she cannot include all of herself in her new identity. In the interview in the eighth grade, she indicates another resignification made, possi made possible by a discourse of gender equality to express and understand her feelings of trouble. I know I've also talked a lot of bullshit, but you just get it back twice as hard, so then it becomes a bit hopeless. I don't always feel that I can be me and say exactly what I want, because I'm afraid that they will throw in a cheeky comment, but most of the boys in our class have not yet really understood what discrimination of women is all about. They don't care. These short glimpses into Astrid's development from child to teen indicate a combination of continuity and change. She negotiates her space very clearly. She learns new ways of doing things. She grasps new opportunities for expression, and her self-image is affected in different ways. But in spite of all this, she also stays herself in the active and often conflict-oriented way she approaches others, in the types of relational scenarios she seems to create around herself. <coughs> we may see her different solutions at different ages as conscious as well as pre- or unconscious resignifications of who she is or can be in relation to others. Her different resignifications are met and evaluated by her surroundings. The other girls and the boys give her feedback on her way of relating and staging her gender. This also applies to the teachers. In primary school, they find her troublesome and define her as a student with problems. In the secondary level, she fits into the, into the discourse of new, active girls, and the teacher's discontent disappears. She's Astrid. They tell me she's Astrid, strong-willed, and a very clever student. That's what Harriet writes. A few words of conclusion. The argument Harriet is making in this talk is that if you throw out the arrow of time, you also throw out vital aspects of subjectivity and are left with contemporary actions in a moving cultural space. If you throw out the subject, you lose the arrow of time and are left with endless processes of signification or flows of affect. Such a move may, of course, enable us to see different aspects of the social. This may be fruitful, but as a sole theoretical or methodological strategy, Harriet does not find this viable. In her view, research on children cannot do without an acknowledgement of subjects, subjectivities, and time. Her conclusion is not that all research projects should be longitudinal. That would prove unrealistic and also unnecessary. But Harriet thinks more synchronic or shorter longitudinal studies should make use of the knowledge that comes from longitudinal designs. In other words, Harriet thinks longitudinal studies of children should contribute theoretically to the understanding of children's lives, which could frame synchronic studies as well. Perhaps a good question to ask in all studies of children could be, what times are in this child?